Good evening. I'm Kelly Wright. Thanks for joining me as we spend the next hour together. I do, as always, hope that you are well, taking care of yourself and your family because you matter. Coming up tonight, we're going to be talking about a case that has gone unnoticed by quite a few media organizations, but we want to shed some light on the unfortunate death of a young Black teenager in Iberia Parish, Louisiana. We'll be talking about that case and get an update from the Baton Rouge NAACP. Then, have you ever discovered your true identity or your true ethnicity? We'll talk to the author of White Like Me. She's on tonight and she'll share her revealing story, an incredible story that you'll want to stay tuned and watch. And then we'll travel across the pond to the UK, England, and there we'll talk about Arthur Wharton. Have you ever heard of him? Tonight you will. Arthur Wharton, the man who predates Jackie Robinson in breaking the color barrier in sports. And now my opening observations. It is always the right time to do the right thing. And those are my opening remarks. Let's get right to it. So joining me now is Eugene Collins of the Baton Rouge NAACP. He's the president of that. And he is joining us to talk about Kawan Bobby Charles, who is uh, a young 15-year-old uh, Black man who has been killed. Uh, the circumstances are very murky at best about what took place, but it took place in Iberia Parish there in Louisiana. Uh, Eugene, uh, thank you for joining us today. This is a very tough time uh, for the people living in that particular parish. Uh, what can you tell me about young uh, Kawan uh, Charles and the fact that everything that's surrounding his death has been very murky in terms of police conducting a proper investigation to determine what happened, what really happened? So, you know, let me start this. I'm the president of the Baton Rouge branch. I consulted and uh, worked with Stan Black uh, in that region around this case. Um, and let me tell you, um, the very first thing that I find troubling with this case is this family went to a whole other city. And you have to understand how some of these things work in South Louisiana to understand what that looks like. So even though these kids went to the same high school, because of the that region, you'll have like maybe 10 small towns around each other and five or six of them will go to the same high school, right? So okay. if you're not from South Louisiana, you might not ex ex understand that dynamic, especially in Acadiana, right? So this family went a town over to Baldwin, Louisiana, took about a 30 or 40 minute drive to a whole other town without parental consent. Um, and when I think about that, just in its core essence, somebody picking up my child and taking them to another town and then finding my child dead three days later. And, and, and that's not even the worst part of that, because they went and looked for the kid the day that he went missing, which was Friday, right? Um, after he didn't return home, they went to police officer and they said, hey, he hasn't returned home. Uh, mom admitted to picking the kid up. So they went and talked to mom. The mom said, hey, yeah, we did pick this kid up. Um, but he got into some form of altercation with our son, woke up, ran out the house, wound up dead uh, some days later. So they reported that, right? So you had a family picking up a kid from uh, another town, um, bringing them to a whole other town without parental consent. Then uh, the family of Kwan Charles alerted law enforcement to that fact. Uh, and they still told that family that he may be at a football game. Now, the next day, we clearly know he's at a football game because he's been missing for a day. But even then, they don't classify him totally as a missing person because he willingly got in the car with the family, uh, we believe, right? Um, but still, they picked that kid up without parental consent. And I hate to say this, right? But I have to think about this as a Black man. As a black man, if I went and picked up a white kid from a different town without parental consent and brought him to my town and he died while in my custody, do you think I'd be sitting here talking to you right now? Absolutely like that's not. that's where we at. So so let me yeah. let me let me let me get this straight then. There's a the, the family uh, of of Kawan uh, is not aware that another family has picked up their child their 15 year old son to take him to another parish. Now this family that picked him up, were they white or black? It was a white family that picked up Kwan Charles. They, uh, they, Kwan went to school with the uh, family's son. And they have an altercation 
and and then inexplicably Kwan ends up missing after that altercation between the two sons. Essentially, that's what happened. And that's per the mom. That's what happens, right? He wakes up um, and their words goes crazy, gets in a fight with their son, ro- runs out the door. While he was in their custody, um, got into an altercation with the son, uh, who now has a broken hand. Uh, that's being left out of the news, who, who now has a broken hand, gets in an altercation with their son and winds up dead. And literally nobody's been arrested. An Amber Alert was never issued. And the state police is arguing that the Amber Alert shouldn't have been issued because it didn't meet the criteria. And and it just seems like the criteria is always different when it involves young Black kids. And right now in South Louisiana, this isn't the only case that we're concerned about when Black people go missing. It just does not seem like we're looked for with the same veracity or the same intent or even the same resources. We have Cody Bochamp here in Baton Rouge who got shot in the upscale neighborhood here on a Sunday in broad daylight with an assault rifle. And I, I don't know if you get the Newsberg apps or the little alerts, but when shootings happen, you're alerted. We weren't alerted to this, and I think it has to do with the neighborhood. Uh, but Cody Bochamp laid there by, like a street over, basically yards away from where he was shot for two weeks before anybody would look for him. Uh, the NAACP had to put a search party together in order to bring attention to that. And they found him like a day after we did that, right? Um, so in that particular instance, it was just a situation where they had just walked around a few houses, right? Uh, there was a young lady in Hammond, their Nisha, activists went out and conducted their own investigation and found that this young lady was possibly in a pond, alerted officers that this young lady was possibly in that pond, and officers chose not to take that tip. Some weeks later, they found her in the exact pond that they were notified that she would be in. Um, so right now in South Louisiana, this is not the only situation where black, young black people go missing and nobody goes to look for them because of an extent of what they did before <laughs> leading up to that, all right? And we, yeah. in all intents and purposes, you know, that shouldn't dictate how we look for missing young people. And when it comes to young black people, it seems like they got to be uh, uh, kids that sit on the front pew of the church for us to go look for them. Um, and, and that's problematic. And, and again, I lean back to this point that if I went and picked up a, a, a young white kid and brought him a, a city over and he wound up dead in my custody, I would be in jail until they figure out what happened. We're coming back with much more after the break. So what's the next step? What is the NAACP uh, as well as uh, uh, the Charles family uh, attorneys? What's left for you to challenge uh, law enforcement to uh, rev up their investigation and and bring some conclusion to this there in in Louisiana? Well, you know, and I'll be complete honest with you, right? This, This is South Louisiana, right? Um, and I, I've been doing this a long time, so I don't expect transparency from South Louisiana. Uh, that, that is not an expectation this nation should have. Uh, that has never been the case here historically, uh, and I don't believe that'll be the, the case in this one. We'll continue to push hard for justice. Uh, we'll continue to push hard for transparency, but I do not expect this atrocious system to ever be transparent to us. You make it sound like there's no hope in finding a, a, a conclusion to this. Is, is that really oh, what you're, you're thinking? It's hope, right? But yeah. it's got to be it's got to be extreme pressure. And you and I spoke to it before this uh, interview began. It, it has to get more attention. It has to get more attention. At the end of the day, if we find out this family didn't drag and beat this kid, right? And then and, and, and keep in mind when, when when terms like hate crimes and lynching are used in 2020, those are not the same things as 1950. If you want to spin right. that narrative into something else, you're just an idiot, right? Um, but outside of just all of that, I think that there is hope. I just don't want to be dishonest with people and say that you're going to get this done with a few Facebook posts. Yeah. This, this is going to require a lot of action. And you know, civil rights rights are long and drawn out. Um, and, and this is this is more, more of an accountability fight. This family should have never been allowed to pick up somebody without parental consent. And, and God bless this family for their patience, for their love, and 
for their forgiveness, right? Because if you had came, picked up my child, uh, took him over to another city and wound up dead, we would have never needed the cops. Yeah. Look, uh, let the family know that uh, on this program and this network, the Black News Channel, we're more than uh, willing uh, to talk to them and have them voice what's going on. Uh, we will make calls to the sheriff's uh, department. I understand they have not been as forthcoming, basically stating that this is still a case under investigation. So they have not commented uh, to, the, to the public media uh, other than the fact that it's under investigation. Uh, but this is, this is heartbreaking. And, and, and to your knowledge, what was young Quan uh, Bobby Charles like? Uh, I mean, to my knowledge, and keep in mind, I'm somebody that's called in the, to advise in these situations. So rarely do I know the people when I step in, right? But to my and to my knowledge, he was a regular teenager, right? Um, you know, full of love, full of promise, and some teenage issues. Um, and that's what I the extent of what I know about him is that he was a he was a he was an American teenager. Yeah. Um, it, it, but it, it just seems like when we die, um, American goes out the window. Eugene, uh, you know, the, the NWCP is, is, uh, is always on, on the front lines of these uh, kinds of cases. Uh, certainly, uh, we'll continue to follow the developments, keep me informed about what's happening. It's, it's a tragedy. And, and that white family that's disappeared, uh, you know, we're, <laughs> that, that is what is, is just mind boggling to me that they were told by police to stay put and, and they packed up their U-Haul, according to what you've heard, and they've moved on. Do you have a name yeah. for that family and where they possibly have, have moved to? So it's, you know, and, and, and Stan Black has been coordinating with the family on that end, as well as attorney Ron Haley and uh, Jamal Taylor and attorney Chase Fischel. Um and I, and I know the family is outside of Youngsville. Um, they, they did move, in, in, in like I say, in a darker night. Um, there wasn't a way to move where you look more guiltier, right? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, we're not, we're not, you know, we, we always assume, uh, assume innocence and, and so proven guilty, but um, it just didn't look well, did not look well. But from my knowledge, they have not late, left the state, uh, but they did leave that area and outside of Lafayette. But they're still in the state of uh, Louisiana. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And well, we'll continue to follow the developments, keep us updated. Uh, and again, we, we leave it open to you and the family to talk to, uh, to, to me or to any of the people on the Black News Channel about this uh, unfortunate case where another young Black life has been killed and there are no explanations as to why and uh, apparently no apology uh, given, but the family, the Charles family already offering forgiveness, but still seeking answers. Eugene, thank you so much. No problem. And we'll be back with more after this. Welcome back to the program. So joining me now is a delightful uh, lady. Her name is Gail Lekasek, and she has quite a story to tell that proves to the world we are all interrelated and interconnected, and we should get over the hangups of race. Uh, Gail Lekasek joins me now. She is the author of the book, White Like Her. Gail, thank you for joining me today. What, a, what an incredible story your life uh, has. Tell me about discovering uh, the, the race and ethnicity of your mother. What was that like? First of all, thank you for having me on your show. I'm delighted sure. to be here. Um, I made this discovery, the initial discovery uh, in 1995. And if I can give you a little backstory on this. Um, my paternal grandfather, Azima Frederick, was my mystery man. My mother had no photographs of him. And every time I asked her about her father, she would say something like, well, you know, my parents were divorced when I was six and we did not, I did not grow up with him. So I can't tell you much. Well, he always remained in the back of my mind because um, I was curious about him. I, I want to know about him. So in 1995, as you know, that's before Ancestry.com yeah. and, and the internet. I didn't have a lot of access to the internet. So I went to our local family history center and started going through census records. I had no birth date or death date. 
When I finally got to the 1900 Louisiana census records, I found Azima Frederick. And next, he was three years old. Next to all the Frederick's names was the letter B. And when I went up to see what that column was, that was for race. So that was my first surprise. I had no idea. You had no idea. I had no idea. All those years, your mother had kept this secret that she was, in fact, Black, or back then, it would have registered her as being colored. Uh, were you shocked? I was, yes. Um, I actually left the center. I had a very unpleasant encounter with the woman who ran the center, because when I went to ask her if B stood for Black, she said, oh, yes, it does. And then she let loose with which she thought were funny, racial slurs, oh. using the N-word. And I, <laughs> there I am standing, not knowing <laughs> what's going on. So I got out of there pretty quickly and sat in my car. I actually looked in my rear view mirror at myself and I thought, I don't know who I am. Wow. I have no idea if this is true, what just happened. Yeah. So what I did, um, I didn't want to call my mother right away. I did, you know, she lives in Ohio. I live in Illinois. I want to do a little more research. I'm a researcher. So what I did is I pretended I was my mother and I wrote to the state of Louisiana and I said, I lost my birth certificate. And so they sent me back my mother's birth certificate and there were three letters for her race. And you probably can guess what they were. Yeah. C O L. Yeah. More colored. But I wasn't done. So I thought, I want the state to tell me what that means to them. So I wrote another letter and said, I'm a little confused. What do these three letters mean? So I got a very official letter from the state of Louisiana with a big seal on it and everything. And what they said was C O L stands for a person of color in most cases of African heritage. So I had all this evidence before I spoke with her. And that conversation with your mother, how did that go? Oh, that was very, that was my other big surprise, my next big surprise. Um, I knew I couldn't have this conversation on the telephone. So unfortunately, my dad got very ill and I wanted to wait. You know, I, I did, it was not the right time. Yeah. So after he died, I invited my mother to visit me in Illinois. I sat her down and I said, mom, I have your birth certificate. It says COL for colored. Talk to me about this. And she denied it. Mm. She said, I don't know what birth certificate you have, but mine says I'm white. Mm. So, you know, she's wily. I wasn't going to let her get away with this. <laughs> so I said, mom, I have other, I have a letter from the state. I have these other documents. I can go get them for you if you like to see them. She got very quiet and she was sitting in this big green chair. It was almost like she was shrinking into the chair. Oh, wow. And then she looked at me and she said, and this was so shocking. How can I hold my head up with my friends if they know? Hmm. You have to promise me you will tell no one until after I die. Oh. I tried to talk her out of it. She was having none of it. And um, I kept her secret for 17 years. We're coming back with much more after the break. What did you go through in terms of understanding who you are and, and what it means to you in moving forward? Well, it was quite a process. Um, initially, you know, there's the shock value. And I did tell my husband, and I have two children, I told them about um, what I discovered and they were cool with it, you know. And, it, you know, life goes on. So um, over those 17 years, I would try to bring the subject up with her again. And she would say something like, well, Gail, how are the kids? So she just didn't want to talk. And then, you know, Ancestry came out. I did, I continued some research into that. 
But, you know, it wasn't at the core center of my life. I was teaching, I was writing. There were other things going on. So uh, my mom passed away in April of 2014. And a very serendipitous thing happened. I just feel there's something guiding me through this um, and something that I have no control over, something spiritual. Three months after her death, my husband by chance finds in our local library newsletter that Genealogy Roadshow is looking for stories from New Orleans, where my mother's from. So my husband says, you have to apply. You just have to. We need to know what your true heritage is. So I did, and I was on the show. And it was confirmed that my mother was mixed race. They had all the documents. It was an amazing experience. And I knew then after I'd been on the show that I was gonna write a book. You know, I'm a writer, that's what I do. Um, but another very, <laughs> Very shocking thing happened after I was on the show. Um, as you know, they taped in August of 2014, but that didn't come out until January of 2015. So anyway, it, was, it aired on a Tuesday. I got up on Friday morning, as I do every morning with my coffee, and look at my emails. And I see I have an email from a person named Stephanie Frederick. Yeah. Now, Frederick is my mother's maiden name. I, I mean, it was like, what? <laughs> so I started reading her email and she said, I watched the show and I want to tell you that my father is Azima Frederick. He is your mother's half brother. I'm your cousin and I want to welcome you to our family. Wow. I sat there and tears course down my face because at that moment every aunt and uncle I've ever known was dead my parents were dead and now I have a cousin and an uncle uh you know it's a it's a touching story an amazing story uh when you look back on your mother's life do you think she had any regrets in keeping this secret and for passing as white all those years, or, or were you able to uh, give her peace of mind that regardless of the color of her skin, you were still her daughter and you loved her? Um, regrets. She had regrets. I, here's what she said to me. This is shortly before her death. I said, well, mom, how are you feeling? You know, I went to see her and she said, well, I have some regrets. And I said, well, what are they? And she said, I don't want to talk about them. Hmm. But she knows that I kept that secret for her, that I honored what she wanted. It wouldn't have been my way, but that was not my secret. So I had to be her daughter. I always, she, she, she knew I had her back. Let's put it that way. We're coming back with much more after the break. Incredible story. And Thank God bless you for bringing it forward and revealing it. And also God bless you for keeping your mother's secret. Although uh, I think you would have liked to uh, let her uh, find that courage to let it out. But uh, you know, your, your, the love that you have for your mother and for your family and, and your, and the family that you've embraced. It, it's so uh, refreshing to hear this kind of story to remind us uh, in this country that we, I keep coming back to we all are interrelated, interconnected, and we've, we've lost sight of that in so many areas of life right now because of, of the polarization in this country. Yeah. Uh, and I just appreciate your story. And I understand your book is coming out again in February as a paperback? Yes, as a paperback. It will be out in February 2021. I'm very excited about that. And I, I, did, I thought maybe Stephanie was going to jump on with us. Uh, <laughs> but let me just say that um, another piece of good news is that her company has option white like her for either a TV dramatic series or a film. And um, her team is assembled. I can't say who the executive producer is, 
But what I can say is he's a well-known Hollywood actor that everyone would recognize. Yeah. I, I know Stephanie was going to say that. So I'm, I'm okay. I'm not in trouble. <laughs> yeah. I'm familiar with who uh, that producer is, executive oh, producer. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know if I have liberty to say it, but uh, I think his name is Jamie Foxx. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Better you than me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll be the bad guy and I'll drop, I'll spill the bean that uh, uh, it is an option uh, and uh, it's good to have an executive producer of that caliber, Academy Award winning and Grammy winning uh, Jamie Foxx uh, taking on your story, White Like Her, and what an incredible story it will tell to remind us all, and I'm saying it again, we're all interrelated and interconnected. It's time we start treating each other as one family uh, and get over this, uh, this stuff that we're going through right now, which is heartbreaking. Uh, incredible story, Gail. Thank yeah. you for bringing it uh, to light. And uh, stay in touch with us, especially as, as that option uh, turns into a reality and I a will. great movie about your life and your mother's life. I appreciate you so much. Well, thank uh, you for giving this opportunity to tell it. Absolutely. Absolutely. The book is called White Like Her, Gail Lucan Casey. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're coming back with more after this. Welcome back to the program. It gives me great pleasure to bring on my good friend, Sean Campbell. He is uh, the founder of the Author Wharton Foundation. And he's also joined today by the marketing manager of BT Sport, which is one of the largest mm -hmm. uh, corporations in the world. And that's Danny Howes. Uh, I'm so delighted that both of you have come on to, to join me in this uh, celebration of the life of Arthur Wharton. And Sean, bring us up to speed because a lot of people, especially here in the United States, they are not aware of Arthur Wharton and the significant contribution that he has made uh, to the world uh, just through his life and, and legacy. Tell me about mm -hmm. Arthur Wharton. Arthur Wharton was a remarkable young man. He was uh, born in 1865, the year of the abolition of slavery in America. He journeyed across the pond to uh, the UK, Vicky's Island, as we call it. And he just blazed just the most amazing trail as a pioneer and as a trailblazer. He was the world's first black professional football player. He was the world's first fastest man on the planet, running a time of 10 seconds dead in 1886. He was a professional cricketer, rugby player. And if that wasn't enough, you know, in his spare time, he became a cycling champion. The guy was just a phenomena, <laughs> a real phenomena. You know? Yeah, you know, I, I like to equate him or and there really there is no uh, equating him because he was singularly yes. Arthur Wharton, but he predated Jackie Robinson in mm -hmm. terms of crossing the color line into any professional sport at a time that you would never have anticipated that a black man from Ghana, from Africa, would make his way into the UK and become such a significant, prolific player who actually changed the world during his time. That's not an easy feat to accomplish. It certainly wasn't. You know, we have to remember that back in the day, back in Victorian England, when Arthur was blazing this trail, it's against the backdrop of a, a very bleak time, an industrial era where life was tough. It was hard. Football was an incredibly brutal sport at that time. Hence, we see Arthur wearing welding gloves, you know, from, from the steel workers. Uh, because as a goalkeeper, you could barrack the goalkeeper, you could barge into him, you could challenge him physically. But Arthur, also being the fastest man in the world, used to just speed away from these guys and he'd go on the wing and he'd score two or three goals. You know, the guy was just so incredibly full of character. And, you know, lest we forget, I mean, he was he, he's from a, a deeply religious family, began his life. His father was a missionary in, uh, born in the island of Grenada in the Caribbean. And uh, underpinning Arthur's character are all those facets of his early upbringing. And without doubt, you know, the man uh, to survive in those times, 
in this island, this small island, when there was so much going on, and it was against the backdrop of the Ashanti Wars in Ghana as well. It's all about strength of character, Kelly. It really is. Yeah, uh, Danny Howes, let me bring you in. Uh, the, the fact that, that BT has entered into uh, this, uh, well, not promotion, but this pr promoting the, the recollection of Arthur Wharton's contribution to the sport of football in, in America, we often call it soccer, but it is one of the greatest sports, if not the largest sport in the world. Uh, what, what did you see in the life and times of Arthur Wharton that made you think there is a, a lot of truth in this and not just truth, but there's a lot of inspiration in this. What, what caused BT to get behind this? Well, I've, I've worked for BT for over 22 years. I'm 45 year old, middle-aged, privileged white man living in Darlington. And as part of the focus on Black History Month in BT, me, myself and my colleagues were looking to to really understand and, and promote forgotten sports stars of the past. And I was aware of, aware, aware of Sean Campbell um, and I was aware of Arthur Wharton and all of, the, all of the great work that Sean did to campaign to have the statue erected at St. George's Park of Arthur Wharton. So I contacted Sean probably six weeks ago now. I'd never met him before. And I met Sean with the hope of bringing him in to BT just to tell myself and my colleagues about Arthur Wharton's story. And I was, I was in, in Sean's presence for over five hours because Sean was telling me things about Arthur Wharton that I'd never heard before. And it was incredible. And I identified quite quickly that there was an opportunity for BT Sport with all of the coverage that they were they had already started in the month of October for Black History Month here in the UK to be able to get BT's resources behind the Arthur Wharton story and use that to, to tell what is the most remarkable, remarkable history. Um, and uh, it, went, it went from there. When we come back, we'll talk more about Arthur Wharton. But before we do, here are a couple of noteworthy people taking note of Arthur Wharton being number one. Stories that should be told for generations. True greatness. So remember the name. Arthur Wharton. Arthur Wharton is number one. 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 Arthur Wharton is Arthur Kwame Wharton is number one. Arthur Wharton is number one. Yeah, and you know, gentlemen, uh, when we look at modern times today, uh, here in America, and of course in the UK, we, we, f we find ourselves dealing with a, a COVID-19 pandemic mm -hmm. uh, and the disparities that that has revealed, uh, like pulling the mask off, if you will, of some ugliness that we have uh, in terms of race. Mm -hmm. uh, the Arthur Wharton story, what do you think it says to modern, uh, to these modern times in which we find ourselves sometimes polarized by politics and polarized by race, but we see that Arthur Wharton started bringing people together and yes. even had a, a mixed race background as well. What does that say to our modern times today in learning to accept each other uh, and understanding that we are interrelated and interconnected? Well, if you were to ask me that, the, the, you know, the, the very serious question of what really motivated me to champion Arthur, we've spoken about his uh, sporting pursuits and his achievements and his pioneering and trailblazing. But Kelly, you've hit the nail on the head, my friend. You know, we're living in dark times at the moment when we look at what's happening politically, both in America and over here and across the globe. We think of the COVID pandemic. This young man, in the face of his own adversity, played seven games of football, 
in 10 days to mm. feed the poor for charity back then when he was being, you know, receiving lots of abuse. His humanitarian spirit, that's what appealed to me, my friend. That is what made me think if we all had a bit of that, the world would be a much better place, you know? Well, Sean and Danny, uh, I, I need both of you to understand that on this show, uh, I always remain a, an open platform and open door to you to come on and, and talk about uh, the Arthur Wharton legacy and, and other people who have done great things uh, throughout the UK and, and the world. Uh, over my shoulder, uh, next, to Man, to, next to my Mandela book is um, a book called Black History 365. Uh, and it's about a curriculum that's been launched here in, in several states in the United States where they're now teaching black history 365 days a year and not making it uh, one month. So Danny, I commend you and BT as I did earlier uh, for expanding uh, the, the understanding of Arthur Wharton and so many other uh, mm -hmm. black people who have made quite a few accomplishments and contributions to the globe. Uh, and I, I just, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm on the sidelines applauding you, but actively engaged in, in telling your story because it is a remarkable story when you look at one singular uh, figure in football and then you see what he did in other sports. It, it's just an amazing story. Uh, and, and it was really a surprise to me that we did not know the Arthur Wharton story mm -hmm. until Sean Campbell came along and said, oh, there's something here that the world needs to know today. Yes, that's right. And I, I'd just like to add that um, the, the number of people that have been involved from, from B, the BT side in making this happen, everyone has um, really, really loved it. It's been a career highlight for a lot of the, a lot of the people I've been working with. And they all fully understand through, not just hearing about Arthur Wharton's story, but also hearing directly from Sean, that the message around Black History mattering and that we have to, you know, open ourselves up and relearn and re-educate uh, about things that, you know, and behaviours that we may have picked up over our, our life to date. And, you know, there's, there's lots, of, lots of Arthur's history that I still don't know about. And there's lots of Arthur's, lots of Arthur's history that even Sean doesn't know about. Mm -hmm that we, we together will, will uncover it and we will share it. So we would really look forward to coming back and, and sharing some, some, some more history and some more stories with you. Well, I welcome that opportunity, Danny Howes and Sean Campbell. And of course, uh, uh, kudos to Arthur Wharton and his legacy. I know he had some, some difficult times uh, on and off the field, but the, the, the fact of the matter is he really... Uh, broke some records back then, and uh, he broke a lot of barriers as well. And we should can have applauded that. Can I say one more thing? Sure. You, you may notice when you look at the mural that the name Kwame is attached to Arthur. Yes. Arthur's never had his African name until the unveiling of that mural. He's now been given his African name, Kwame, born on a Saturday. Every Ghanaian, well, if you're Kofi, you're born on a Friday. If you're Kwame, you're born on a Saturday. And at long last, it gives me great pride and it's an honour to give Arthur his African name. And it has been widely received in Ghana and beyond. And um, it was long overdue, my friend, long overdue. Well, thank you, my friends. Anytime you come on this show, you're no longer strangers. You are friends. The open door is always extended to you. Uh, Sean Campbell, Danny Howells, thank you so much. And my best to you and the, uh, the effort you're making to, to make the Arthur Wharton story even more uh, renowned throughout the world. Thank you both. Thank you so Thank much. You very much. Welcome back to the program. I want to thank all of the guests tonight who appeared on this show. And I especially want to thank each and every one of you for taking time out to watch. I do sincerely appreciate you. In closing tonight, hopefully we've been righted, ignited, and united to keep spreading love, freedom, and peace. It's certainly what we need more of today. Good night. Just
rip through the heart of the city, inflicting pain and casualty. A cowardly act of despicable terror, increasing fear and misery. The way we're living our lives Oh, it's so crazy This kind of living ain't right In times like these Do you ever wonder We need, we need a savior In times like these ever wonder we need a savior your broken heart so bruised and battered tearing apart at the seams your wounded life so torn and tattered filled with regrets and broken dreams crazy the way we're living this life oh, it's, so crazy. it's so crazy this kind of living ain't right in times like these do you ever wonder could it be we need a savior in times like these salvation mm. please come and heal the nations lord we need deliverance oh please come and give us forgiveness well